Welcome to worship from the Bucknell team. I've just taken the dog for a walk and it's currently minus four degrees, so I'm not going to be out here for long. If you've joined us lots of times, it's great to see you again. If this is your first time with us, you are most welcome today. Father God, as we gather together to worship you and to listen to your word, would you be with us? Thank you for your promise that when we draw near to you, you will draw near to us. Amen. We've got a great service lined up for you this first Sunday of Advent. So thank you for joining with us. All creation gives you praise. You alone are truly great. You alone are God who reigns. For eternity. Already just in these first few minutes of being outside, the temperature's risen by three degrees. A great reminder, the sun is out even though it's cold and slowly things are thawing. A great reminder in this Advent season as we light our first candle, our candle of hope, reminding us that God is always bringing hope. God is always thawing out the coldness of our hearts, the coldness that we see all around us. So God, would you be doing that with us today? We pray. Come on, let's light our first Advent candle. And then I'm going inside. Oh gosh, that's better. And I should also say Happy New Year, of course, because this is the beginning of the churchy year as we look forward and begin the Advent season. Historically, also known as Stir Up Sunday, when the ingredients in the Christmas pudding would all be given a good stir. So the Gospel of John speaks of Jesus coming as the true light into the world in commemoration of his coming. We light our four candles to reflect on the arrival of Jesus. And it's significant. The church has always used that language, the coming of Christ. It's a deep truth of Christ coming into our world and coming again into our troubled hearts. And that one day he will come again in glory. So, as we light our first candle, the candle of hope, we dare to express our hopes, our longings for peace and for healing and for the well-being of all creation. Loving God, as we enter this Advent season, we open all the places in our lives and memories to the healing light of Christ. Show us the creative power of hope. Prepare our hearts to be transformed by you, that we may walk in the light of Christ. Amen. Come on, let's lift our hearts and our voices and praise and worship our God. Jesus, hope of the nations. Jesus, comfort for all who mourn. You are the source of heaven's hope. Light in the darkness, Jesus, truth in each circumstance. You are the source of heaven's light on earth. In history, you lived and died.
the source of heaven's light on earth. In history, you lived and died. You broke the chains. You rose to life. You are the hope living us. You are the rock in whom we trust. time to listen to the word of God. Our readings today are going to be read by Brittany and by Pat. To you, O oh Lord, I lift up my soul. O oh my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Let none who look to you be put to shame. But let the treacherous be shamed and frustrated. Make me to know your ways, O oh Lord, and teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you have I hoped all the day long. Remember, Lord, your compassion and love. For they are from everlasting. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. But to think of me in your goodness, O Lord, according to your steadfast love. In the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many peoples shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the house of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and he shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hawks. Nation shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn uh, war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Now today, for the last time, I'm going to hand over to, over to Reverend Andrew Dawswell, um, who has been speaking in our digital services for oh nearly the last year. This is the last time he's going to be doing that. So a big thank you to Reverend Andrew, and um, I'll hand over to him for his final message to us. I wonder what your feelings are about receiving a surprise visit. My parents told the tale of their participation in a surprise anniversary party for my mum's cousin. It was organised by that cousin's daughter, and she was only in her early 20s at the time, so they thought they'd better go along with it. The anniversary, though, was on the day that the cousin and her husband flew home from holiday. The flight was a bit delayed, and arriving at their front door rather frazzled late in the evening... They had to pretend to be delighted at the sight of a room full of people. The way my mum and dad told the story, it was very clear that they never wanted us to attempt anything similar when they were returning from a stressful journey, and probably not at all. Sometimes, of course, you can learn a great deal from a surprise visit. The story is told of a father passing through his son's university town late one night on a business trip, who decided to pay a surprise visit to the boy. Arriving at the house he shared with several other undergraduates, the dad knocked on the door. After several minutes of knocking, a sleepy voice drifted down from a second-floor window. What do you want? 
Does Jimmy Jones live here? asked the father. Yeah, replied the voice. Dump him on the front porch again and we'll take care of him in the morning as we did last week. If all that makes us wary of such things at a human level, we need to be aware that, like it or not, Jesus taught that his return to our world would in some ways be similar. You might like to turn with me to Mark chapter 13. People often think that the whole of that chapter is about the second coming. But my understanding is that most of the first half of our Bible reading, up to verse 30, is about the events that took place in the lifetime of Jesus' own listeners. Referring in those earlier verses to Jesus' ascension, his coming into heaven in AD 30, something like 40 days after the first Easter, and then to the destruction of Jerusalem, which we know took place in AD 70. I take that view because what Jesus explicitly says in verse 30, in relation to what he's just foretold, that this generation will not pass away until these things take place. And also because he says that just as obvious when leaves appear on the trees that the summer is to follow shortly, so it will be equally obvious that those events are about to happen. But in verse 32, the Lord then continues, Concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. And so he says in verse 33, Be on your guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. Jesus then gives the comparison of a wealthy man going on a journey and giving his servants a number of tasks to do in his absence, including appointing someone who is to guard the entrance to his property, and for whom one major component of his job, as with any security guard, is to make sure that he stays awake. Easier said than done, I'd guess. Why do the servants need to do as they've been instructed, and especially the appointed doorkeeper? because they have not been told when the master will return. It could happen any time, in the evening, at midnight, when the cock crows at the first sign of dawn, or in the morning. And if, when the master returns, the doorkeeper is asleep, well, he's obviously going to be in some kind of trouble. And Jesus uses that everyday scenario as a picture of his second coming. For he too is a master who, though about to go away from his servants, will one day return. And he too will be concerned with what he discovers on that day, about how well his servants have been carrying out his instructions. Hence the instruction to his followers, verse 33, Be on your guard, keep awake. I'm aware that some people's first reaction may be that this is all a bit sneaky on the Lord's part. Can't Jesus do the decent thing and tell people when his return will be? And there are several responses to that that might be given. First of all, we might be tempted to make a comparison with any monitoring process, which, as well as scheduled visits, may well have some unannounced visits common practice for any boss to do that. They don't only want to see how things are done when those they supervise know that they are coming, but also reserve the right to drop in any time to see what a more, more, what a more normal moment in the day looks like. For quite a while, uh, we've been finding it hard to work out who we will employ as a church as our agent to provide professional monitoring of Fords, the builders, as they construct our new hall. Then a couple of weeks ago, uh, all the attempts yielded several viable possibilities. And we're pleased to say we've been able to make an appointment and with fees rather lower than we've allowed for in our budget. Interestingly though, one of the candidates when we interviewed him specifically said that some of his site visits would be unannounced. And of course, in any field, the knowledge that there'll be that kind of spot check will be one of the factors motivating people to do their job properly. And Jesus seems to be using the unexpected timing of his return to be a motivation for us as his followers to be faithful in our service, day in, 
day out. Of course, when you think about it, that's not the only reason to be serving the Lord faithfully. For his ways are the best ways, both for the good of his kingdom and also in the end for us as the laborers, even when what he demands of us is hard. As well as that, the all-seeing Lord knows what we do all the time anyway. Last week we focused on the part of Jesus' teaching where he speaks in more detail about the way he will one day sit in judgment on every single member of the human race, sending each person into one of two very different destinations, eternal life in heaven or the eternal fire, a way of speaking about hell. And that more detailed teaching makes clear His judgment will not solely be based on how he finds us at the exact moment of his return, but on whether our lives as a whole show an acceptance of him or a rejection, both being indicated by how each person has treated the Lord's family on earth. I take that to mean both in their attention or lack of it towards other believers' general needs, and also in our willingness to embrace and support those who, like the original 12 apostles, had a special responsibility for conveying Jesus' message. Of course, if, let's say, St. Thomas arrived in your town bearing the good news of Jesus, the Lord himself wouldn't be physically present to see with his eyes who welcomed Thomas and his words and who ignored him. But that part of Jesus' teaching leaves us in no doubt that on the day of final judgment, the Lord will know exactly what our response has been. For of course, he's by then ascended to heaven, where he is the all-seeing, all-knowing Lord. Now, some critics will cheerfully set up what Jesus is saying in this week's Bible reading against what he said in last week's. To avoid this, today's focus on what you or I will be doing at the exact moment Jesus returns must be seen, well, more as a means of motivating us to faithful service than telling the whole story about the basis on which we'll be judged. I certainly remember, as a young Christian, hearing sermons on this passage which encouraged me to make the most of every moment in the Lord's service on the principle that a believer wouldn't want to be ashamed of what we were doing if that was the very point in time that the Lord chose to return. There's also a a second reason why the timing of Jesus' return will be unexpected, and that's because he himself didn't know. Verse 32, but concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Theologians needed to do a bit of thinking to work out how that fits in with what I've just said. They concluded that in becoming flesh, God the Son had to temporarily set aside some of his attributes of deity. It's what Philippians 2 calls the Lord emptying himself. And it's obvious that the Lord Jesus wasn't omnipresent in his earthly life, for example. If he'd been born knowing everything, his growing up would have been a completely different experience from any other human experience of childhood. And we know that's not true. So in the years of his public ministry that are recorded in the Gospel, though he has supernatural knowledge of many things, it's clear that doesn't apply to everything, as he spells out in this statement. That point, though, is almost incidental to the main thrust of what Jesus is saying, which is that in the light of the uncertain timing of his return, we need to be on our guard, to keep awake. Being on guard, first of all, maybe some here have served as a soldier on guard, or perhaps done a stint as a security guard. Perhaps some people have had a guarding or defence role in football or netball or some other sport. The nearest to that I can bring to mind is taking the Rimmers role in a game of table football with our after-school excite group a few weeks ago. 
Others may remember having that guarding role, perhaps with their own children or grandchildren, perhaps at the seaside or in a park with several hazards to watch out for, keeping watch to make sure that uh, no dangers befell those in your charge. That kind of alertness of being on guard is meant to characterise the Christian's life. Careful that as far as we can, what we do and don't do is pleasing in the Lord's sight. Always aware that when we, that what we do or don't do matters to him. As an aside, that's why the Bible tells believers not to get drunk, because it means voluntarily surrendering our being on guard, our self-control. And then secondly, keep awake, the Lord Jesus says. That's another picture designed to communicate something very similar. Not that it should be taken literally. Indeed, you don't have to deprive yourself of actual sleep for very long to lose control in a different kind of way. But staying awake spiritually, always thinking where there might be opportunities to serve the Lord at the same time as we're on our guard against temptations to let him down. And always prepared so that if that time of his return is the hour or the day or the month or the year or the decade or the century that we're in right now, we're not found wanting. Joan Cocker is going to lead us in prayer. Let us pray. At the beginning of Advent, we hear the voice of Isaiah. Despite our sin and weakness, he says, Yet, Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, you are the potter, and all of us are your handiwork. We pray that you will mould us and shape us during this Advent season so that we may align our vision with your will and be ready to receive you into our hearts. Almighty God, give to us and to your whole church new vision and new hope that we may be expectant and ready to hear again your message of love and forgiveness. Give special blessing to all church leaders as they prepare to bring the good news of Christmas to their own flock and to the wider world. Further afield, we pray for Tear Fund, assisting churches in many parts of the world to tackle poverty and injustice. We pray especially for the Zoe Project in Zimbabwe, which mobilises local churches to respond to the needs of many orphans and vulnerable children. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the leaders of nations and for the leaders of groups within nations, that they may be governed by your wisdom and able to lead others in the way of justice and peace. We pray for an end to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in the Middle East and for the building of a spirit of reconciliation, of reconstruction, of healing and of lasting peace. We pray for the people of Ukraine suffering greatly in their conflict with Russia. And we pray for mediators and all who are negotiating behind the scenes to bring peace to these and other areas of conflict. We pray for migrants and refugees who seek a peaceful place to settle and work. Support, we pray, all who help the homeless to find suitable accommodation and shelter from the cold winter weather and to address problems of domestic violence and drug and alcohol abuse. We pray for your presence and guidance in the lives of unhappy children, neglected or abused, for your help for those who are out of their depth and are without sound advice and guidance, for those in trouble with the law and those in detention centres. And we pray for adequate services to deal with young offenders to give them a fair chance in life. As the Climate Change Conference begins in Dubai, we pray for progress in reducing the use of fossil fuels across the world to reduce carbon emissions, 
and helping countries adapt to the necessary changes. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are unable to cope at this time and are weighed down with troubles. We pray that your healing hand will touch their lives and comfort them in their pain, their fear, their anxiety, loneliness or loss of independence. We remember the bereaved families and friends of Dorothy Griffiths, Margaret Lee and Karen Smith and we pray that you will support them in their loss and assure them of your presence in their lives. Loving Father, let us pray for all we know in their particular need. And we pray that you will accept these and all our prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And may God and may God bless you in this season of Advent, particularly this week, as we think about hope. Who, oh Lord, could save themselves? Their own soul could heal. Our shame was deeper than the sea. Your grace is deep still. Who, oh Lord, could save themselves?
for today. So may Christ, the Son of Righteousness, shine upon you, scatter the darkness from before your path and make you ready to meet him when he comes in glory. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you. Give you the strength that you need for today and the bright hope that you need for tomorrow. Amen. God bless you and hope to see you soon. For your endless mercy.